Welcome to Moriel TV. My name is Joshua, live with James Jacob Prash in New York City on September 30th, 2018, for This Week in Prophecy. Jacob. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. Thank you so much for joining us. You know the events of the Kavanaugh hearings and the controversy surrounding it has so eclipsed other world events that events of prophetic significance, particularly in the Middle East, are being underreported or ignored almost because of the hypermedia focus on what is taking place in Washington. Now, to a degree, this is understandable, but we need to look at the panorama of events, not just events in Washington or in the Middle East or any other one place. We try to take a more comprehensive approach, anything affecting prophecy. The Kavanaugh events are self-explanatory. The hypocrisy and treachery of what is popularly referred to as the swamp could not be more apparent. Um, the outrage that we see of a man being considered guilty simply because he's a male and a woman being believed simply because she's a woman. Uh, unable to name the time or place or year of the alleged sexual assault, just saying that she was sure it was Mr. Kavanaugh when in fact all four witnesses she cites cannot corroborate it as having, having even happened. Demanding an FBI investigation in addition to the six that were already carried out by the FBI in terms of background checks, not criminal investigations. Now this has been obviously nonsensical. Everyone knows that sex criminals are pattern. They are serial offenders. With six earlier FBI background checks, if anything of that nature was to be in any sense true, something would have come to light after six background checks. In fact, no fewer than 60 women who have known Mr. Kavanaugh going back to college and high school throughout his professional and judicial career, 60 have signed statements saying He's not that kind of person. He has never behaved in an ordinate way sexually with women ever. Um, yet the left claims that this woman who can't tell you when or where, Dr. Ford, whose lawyer is a militant activist, Dr. Ford herself an anti-Trump activist, whose mother was evicted by a court order issued by Judge Kavanaugh's mother, who was a judge, who had a motive to both lie that was personal and political. It's not to say she is lying, it's just to say she had motive to do so. She has no corroborative evidence. The witnesses she cites say they can't corroborate this, they don't believe it happened. And 60 women who worked with Mr. Kavanaugh for all of his adult life, going back to his youth, say he's never behaved in this particular way. There's no serial history of sex crimes which is characteristic of sex criminals, nothing ever having surfaced in the earlier six FBI investigations. Yet we see senators from New York and Hawaii, California, left-wing bigots making mountains not, out of molehills, except that they're not even molehills. They're nothing. It's all fabricated and invented. It's going no place fast, but it's politically engineered. The real issue, of course, is not women. The real issue is Roe v. Wade. It's a spiritual battle. We have spoke about that last week. It's ongoing this week. Continue to play, pray, please, for President Trump. There is a spiritual battle for the moral future of the United States. Will the period of respite that we've seen in Great Britain with Brexit and in America continue? Similarly, Please pray for the pro-Brexit forces in Great Britain. Um, a native New Yorker, ironically, uh, Boris Johnson, uh, leading the charge again against the enemies of Brexit, even with his, in his own party. There is a spiritual battle transpiring in Great Britain over the forces who would like to have a second referendum and muster all the power they can to defeat it again against the democratically expressed will of the British voters. We're dealing with treacherous people with a treacherous agenda, but there is a demonic element underlining much of this. It is about much more than 
what they're telling us. They don't care about women. They say they speak for women, but somehow the 60 women who came out in favor of Judge Kavanaugh don't count. We see that the predicted disasters for the British economy did not happen when Britain voted to Brexit. And there will be further improvements. Yet, this is supposed to be ignored. Their scaremongering didn't work, so they need a new strategy. Well, on to the Middle East this week. These events that have been taking place in Washington and in London, again, have caused an underreporting of what is happening in the Middle East. Over the last year and a half to two years, there has been something of a, not detente, but certainly rapprochement between the Netanyahu government of Israel and Mr. Putin. They may have been friendly enemies, but they were friendly. Mr. Netanyahu repeatedly visiting Moscow. High-level military and diplomatic meetings taking place continually in both Moscow and in Israel with the aim of avoiding conflict between Israel and Russia. There is a reason for this in the fear that the war of attrition of 1969 and 1970 would repeat itself. More about that in a moment. However, Mr. Putin is once again under tremendous domestic pressure politically. Following the downing by Syria of an II-20 reconnaissance plane killing perhaps 19 Russian military airmen. This coming on the heels of perhaps as many as 300 Russian mercenaries, former Spaznets, military commandos being killed by U.S. Marines and Kurdish forces that are trained and, and armed by the United States on the banks of the Euphrates. The losses of life are not unnoticed, even though Mr. Putin's regime is neo-Stalinist and controls most of the media inside Russia. In the age of internet, their control is not complete. He's under pressure. And he is acting. This week in prophecy, S-300 Russian missiles and the new electronic warfare system have been deployed inside of Syria. Benjamin Netanyahu has called the Russian action irresponsible in communication with Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. The S-300 is quite an effective anti-aircraft missile. It would be very difficult with, electric, or with electronic countermeasures for the Israelis to evade it when it operates in conjunction with the electronic warfare system that has terrestrially been deployed simultaneously. Now let's speak more about this. The Russian National Security Advisor, Mikhailov Petroshev, has said that Russia will not in any sense pressure Iran to leave Syria. He said this in a meeting with the Syrian, with the Iranian counterpart in Tehran this week, al Shamanakani. No deal. There had been a tentative, tentative agreement that Israel would stop airstrikes against Iranian targets inside of Syria if Russia persuaded Iran to stop supplying and supporting Hezbollah in Lebanon and in Syria. This now has become a no deal. Russia is going to allow Iran to continue to support and supply Hezbollah, who are controlled largely by the Assad regime and by Iran, with the wherewithal in terms of ammunition, munitions, and funding to continue their anti-Israel campaign. Bearing in mind, there have been ugly conflicts in southern Lebanon with Hezbollah that have resulted in the deaths of many people, and thousands and thousands, approximately 6,000, Katusha rockets falling on northern Israel, even doing significant damage to the city of Haifa. No deal, 
it's now going to continue. At the same time, the electronic warfare system that is deployed is one which can track Israeli Air Force flights inside of Israel, not over Syria, not over the Mediterranean, not over Lebanon, not an in international airspace, but over Israel's own airspace. It is a very advanced system. Certain nations, such as the United States and Russia, have this technological capacity. Israel has this technological capacity. But now the Russians are operating it in and in conjunction with and on behalf of the Syrian regime, but also in de facto conjunction with Iran. This becomes very dangerous. Additionally, this week in prophecy, the Bakora M2 anti-missile system is being deployed around Damascus in the event that Israeli cruise missiles or aircraft of various descriptions, even drones or helicopters, manage to evade the electronic warfare detection system or the S-300s, these short-range missiles that are very, very accurate, will be able to defend Damascus against any Israeli incursion. Quite a problem. The presence of these things, however, are not even isolated. It was announced by the Putin regime that Russia is going to further increase its military presence in the eastern Mediterranean. This builds on what we warned about last week of Russia attempting to control international waters off the coast of Lebanon and Syria. The unspoken factor in this is the Leviathan oil and natural gas field. Nonetheless, as we reported last week, an American carrier task force led by the USS Harry Truman and other American vessels are being deployed in the same general region. And there has been an increase in American aircraft activity flying out of British bases in Cyprus. These are sovereign British bases, not controlled by the Cypriot government, but are British territory, similar to what Guantanamo is for the United States. The Israelis, the Americans, the Greeks, other NATO forces routinely use these bases covertly, even though the bases themselves are British. Much is going on, particularly in terms of aerial reconnaissance and intelligence gathering. But it's happening this week in prophecy. Now, we have to understand the nature of what's transpiring and what people are so fearful of. The U.S., as well as Russia, believe that Mr. Netanyahu's goal of removing or seeing Iran removed from Syria is not practically possible. Mr. James Jeffries, the American advisor to the Trump administration on Syria, echoes this belief. The United States' approach to dealing with Iran is sanctions, embargoes, making it economically costly for Iran to carry on its activities in Syria and elsewhere, including Yemen and so forth, as well as its support for terror. This is the main American strategy. The strategic efforts by the Israelis to have Iranian forces, including the Revolutionary Guard, removed from Syria are not working very well. Meanwhile, this week in prophecy, it was announced in Tehran by the Iranian foreign minister that Iran completely rules out any idea of a summit between Rouhani and Mr. Trump. It's not going to happen the way it happened with the North Korean dictator. Uh, it's just not going to take place with the Iranians. Mr. Trump had said in the interest of peace he'd be open to it, but the Iranians have rejected this, and it's not going to take place according to the Iranian Foreign Ministry, announced this week in prophecy. 
Also, Lebanon has categorically denied that there has been a, a deployment by Hezbollah of Iranian-provided missiles and, and anti-aircraft missiles in the area around Beirut Airport and near a soccer field or a football field in Beirut. The Israelis have highlighted the locations of these things, but the Lebanese foreign minister denying it has invited an international delegate to inspect the, the areas where the Israelis say they are deployed. Now, of course, if these things are mobilely mounted, they could easily be moved and then moved back or moved to another location. I don't know what such a inspection would really achieve if they are on a mobile delivery system. Nonetheless, Lebanon is denying the Israeli claim that the Iranian provided missile batteries to Hezbollah in the area of Beirut airport. Again, we are seeing a juxtaposition of Syria and Lebanon converging with not only Iran, but Iranian, Iranian animated forces and allied forces, that is Syria and Hezbollah on the northern front of Israel. A major, major war could take place involving Syria, Israel, and Lebanon, with Iran a de facto party in the war, and the Russians a player in the conflict at the same time the United States is active in Syria itself, as well as both Russian and American naval forces in the Eastern Mediterranean. It is quite a scenario, and it does not even take into account the role of Turkey, potentially, this week in prophecy. The Americans believe even the Russians could not persuade Iran to leave. They are there, and they do not want to go away. The only way to choke them off, other than through economic means, is to prevent air flights over Iraq, but they would easily be able to circumvent that by flying to the north and then flying to the south again, uh, providing the Turks did not object. Hence, we have seen a rapprochement also between the Erdogan government and the Iranians. Some weeks they're friends, some weeks they're antagonistic towards each other. There's always a big question mark over this. But there is a consensus in Washington and in Moscow that Mr. Netanyahu's goals are impossible unless there is a ground war. Unless there is a ground war in Syria involving the Israelis, there's no way to remove the Iranians, even if the Russians wanted to. That is what is being trumpeted in Washington and in Moscow and in Damascus. If this is the case, the prospects are raised for a ground war. Now remember, the United States, together with the Kurds, has been involved in a ground war against ISIS in eastern Syria. But that has resulted in direct military conflict between the United States and Russia already, with Russia losing perhaps 300 commandos turned mercenaries. Now, with the loss of the II-20 plane, Russia is becoming very frustrated. Mr. Putin must be seen as doing something, taking some action, hence the deployment of the S-300 and the new electronic warfare system that can track planes inside of Israel itself. What this resembles in the thinking of the Russians, in the thinking of the Americans, and in the thinking of the Israelis is a recapitulation of what was known as the War of Attrition in 1969 and 1970. Following the Six-Day War, Gamal Nasser was desperate to recapture, recoup territorial losses in the Sinai and reopen the Suez Canal, vital to the economy of Egypt. There were commando raids, artillery barrages that resulted 
in an Israeli response using the Israeli Air Force. At that time, flying were now obsolete, but then advanced American F-4 Phantoms, as well as modified Mirage jets of a French design, and sometimes manufacture. The Israelis eventually produced their own version of the Mirage called the Kefir. But then you're talking about Mirages and Phantoms up against Russian M MiG-23s and MiG-25s. These were the most advanced fighter aircraft of the day. The Soviets, as they were then, put money, technology, and advisors into Egypt beyond what were there before the Six-Day War. The Six-Day War proved a huge humiliation, not just for the Muslim Arab world, not just for Egypt, but for Russia itself. This was before the United States had begun to back Israel in a major way with military technology. Not having that, just having what they had themselves, more or less, a little bit from the United States and a certain amount from France, which at that time was more friendly to Israel, the Israelis humiliated not simply the Syrians and the Egyptians and even the Jordanians, but humiliated their Soviet sponsors. Again, Russia was posturing. Russia was humiliated. Russia was under political pressure within the party, even though they could completely control public opinion within the Communist Party there were ramifications of the different power blocks within the party. People were frustrated in Moscow. Not only that, but there was a fear that Nasser would be deposed or removed from office and be replaced by a pro-Western leader, which eventually happened with Anwar Sadat, who was assassinated by the Muslim Brotherhood in essence, it was them working to a front organization. But before Sadat came to power, Nasser was trying to hold on to power prior to his death. And the Russians had no choice but to back him because the alternative could have been someone pro-Western. Now, we have to understand at this time that the conflict in the Middle East was very much an ancillary conflict of the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union, between the West and the Communist bloc of Eastern Europe. It was seen as a proxy war for conflict between the United States, the West, and Russia, even though the United States had not yet backed Israel to the same degree it began to do at the time of the 1973 Yom Kippur War. The fact that America was not yet supporting Israel to a huge degree, while Russia was supporting Syria and Egypt, compounded the humiliation of the Muslim world. We're being backed by the Soviet Union. You're standing alone. How could you do this to us? A little bit of help from America, some from France, but not a lot. Islamic sensitivity was offended. Russia was troubled, hence the war of attrition. The Israelis sustained significant casualties and losses in the war of attrition, although they inflicted greater damage upon the Egyptians. It wasn't going to work but it was going to be costly, tit for tat, dragging it on with the Soviets backing Egypt, but nobody backing Israel to any large degree. They would try to wear Israel down by attrition. When the Israelis made the cost higher and higher by the use of the Air Force, the Kremlin responded by deploying Soviet planes 
fly, flown by Soviet fighter pilots to Egypt, doing patrols inside of Egypt. The Israelis wanted at least a 30-kilometer clearance along the line of conflict, later known as the Bar Lev Line, paralleling the Suez Canal. Russia began operating in that area, making aerial combat between Russia and Israel inevitable. It finally happened. The Israelis using Russian-speaking Israeli ground communication operators set a trap for the Soviet Air Force. Having Mirage jets flying close together, the Israelis created the impression that there were two planes where there were four, or that there were four planes where there were eight in close flying formation. They used their best pilots to prevent collisions, aerial collisions, and to maintain coordinated air mobility efforts for the conflict that was going to take place with the trap that had been set for the Soviets. The first generation of American F-4 Phantoms were now operational nearby. You had a juxtaposition of Russian and Israeli fighter craft. The Russians using their best MiG-23s and MiG-25s, the most advanced Soviet plane at that time, before the Sukhoi was invented, totaling 24 aircraft. The Israelis using their Mirage jets and their American Phantom F-4s had 16. So despite the numerical odds being in favor of the Soviets, the Soviets thought that they were sending 24 planes to take out perhaps six or eight Israeli planes. In fact, there were 16 Israeli planes, and within three minutes, within three minutes, the Israeli Air Force shot down five Soviet planes, the most advanced Soviet fighter aircraft at the time. Five were shot down within three minutes. This added tremendously to the embarrassment and humiliation of the Soviet Union already humiliated by the Six-Day War. Even the Egyptians began to mock the Soviet pilots. Gamal Nasser issued orders commanding the Egyptian military not to mock or make fun of or belittle or to satirize, satirize the Russian pilots or the Russian military performance who were humiliated by the Israelis at this dogfight, an actual dogfight between Israel and Russia. Again, it was a trap using Russian-speaking Israeli ground operators. Be that as it may, this created a big problem. Now there was a major, major chance of armed conflict between Russia and Israel not only by the proxy means of Egypt. Kissinger and Nixon stepped in. Unfortunately, as they would also later do in the peace that Kissinger brokered after the Yom Kippur War, the United States did neutralize the conflict and broker an end to the war of attrition. But unfortunately, allowing for the ongoing deployment of Soviet electronic warfare apparatus and anti-aircraft missiles along the Suez Canal, as well as surface-to-surface -surface missiles that were used to spearhead the Yom Kippur attack in 1973. Kissinger's hand was not even. It was also not even when the Americans brokered the peace in 1973. 
the American diplomatic victory came when Sadat came to power and the Soviets were kicked out of Egypt with even a greater humiliation. The Suez Canal was reopened. This eventually led to Camp David and a peace between Israel and Egypt and Russia was no longer a factor in the equation. Russia remembers this. Israel remembers this. The United States remembers this. Israel and Russia have been bending over backwards to avoid direct military conflict with each other. Since the downing by Syria of the I-20 reconnaissance plane with 19 deaths, Israel has not attacked any Iranian targets in Syria that we know of. Israel has suspended its operations for fear of coming into direct conflict with Russia. Russia, humiliated, is posturing. Losing that plane, 19 dead, on top of the 300 dead, and although it was shot down by Syria, they are blaming Israel when in fact the Israeli presence was only a contributing factor. It was Syrian and Russian incompetence that was largely responsible for the downing of the plane. In the meantime, what we see is a further disintegration of diplomatic efforts. The new Trump peace plan is already, for all intent and purposes, nearly dead in the water even before its formal proposition. Mr. Trump has followed through calling for a two-state solution, as have his predecessors. The American defunding of the United Nations Relief Work Agency has resulted in efforts by the Palestinian Authority to find alternative sources for the funding. There are reports that they are getting it, though how much can be debated. Meanwhile, there have been armed conflicts, not just with Gaza, but now in the West Bank, specifically in the area around Ramallah, the headquarters of the Palestinian Authority. Six Palestinians were injured when the Israelis attacked a pharmaceutical warehouse that was being used for terrorist purposes. Things are now beginning to heat up on the West Bank, not just in Gaza. In Gaza, this week in prophecy, Israeli sappers, ordnance disposal units of the Israeli military, have disarmed and disabled approximately 100 incendiary devices of various descriptions coming from inside Gaza. But up to 20,000, 20,000 is the estimate, Gazans have been rioting at the border with Israel. The Hamas regime has been forcing children to go to the forefront, secure in the knowledge that when Israel is attacked and is forced to counterattack, the casualties will be children and CNN, the BBC, etc. will say, look what Israel did. This is a typical strategy used by Hamas to attack Israeli civilians, attack Israeli children. When the Israelis are forced to return fire and self-defense, they use their own children and civilians as human shields. The Western media automatically taking their side. This is what we've seen repeatedly. Well, this is not new, except that it's becoming worse. This week in prophecy, in response to the proposals of the Trump administration that have yet to be fully, prop uh, fully presented, already Jordan rejects any confederation with the Palestinian Authority. We can understand the objections of King Abdullah of Jordan to doing this. Again, he's a prisoner of history. Going back to Black September in September of 1970, 
when the Palestinians attempted to take over the Hashemite government of Jordan. This is Yasser Arafat's gunman. The British trained and equipped Jordanian army massacred between 12 and 15, I'm sorry, between 15 and 18,000 of Arafat's PLO gunmen within 12 days time. It was a bloodbath, killing far more Palestinians than the Israelis ever have in an armed conflict. Jordan lives in the fear of that. They are afraid of anything that would empower the Palestinian Authority to have any political influence in or with Jordan. Jordan disowned its claims to the West Bank years ago. It's something they don't want. Now, understand this. In the Camp David Accords, Menachem Begin offered Gaza back to the Egyptians. Have a coalition with the Palestinian Arabs in Gaza. The Egyptians didn't want a coalition with the Palestinians, and the Jordanians don't want one. Other Muslims, other Arabs, do not want any partnership of any real substance with the Palestinians. They'll give them money, they'll give them feigned propaganda support, but they're not going to actually do anything. They know what the PLO is, and they certainly know what Hamas is. Mr. Abbas has also himself begun to thwart the Trump proposals at a meeting in New York. He invited everyone except the United States and Israel, of course. Russia, China, the UK, France, 40 nations to look for an alternative proposal to the one set forth by the Trump administration. Meanwhile, the Trump administration, having closed the PLO liaison offices, the diplomatic offices of the PLO in Washington, has seen Hassam Zomlat, the representative, had his residential permit to stay with his family in the United States canceled. He was told to leave the country. His family appears to be still there. Also, the PLO bank accounts in the United States were closed. Mr. Abbas is also having a separate meeting with Mr. Manuel Macron of France. If there's any nation in the world that likes to put its own neck in a noose, it is France. They are under increasing threat of Islamic radicalism, Paris surrounded, basically under siege by a huge Islamic population filled with militancy in the Banle belt around Paris. Yet he continues to pander to Islamic demands despite the Charlie Hebo, despite the Paris terrorist attacks, he continues to follow this policy of believing if he panders and campaigns against the policies of Israel and the Trump administration, he's somehow going to placate the radical Islamic population in France. This has never worked and it never will work. Again, we point to Obadiah 15. These nations who tried to hurt Israel this way by collaborating with Israel's enemies will become the enemies of those same nations who are Israel's enemies. They will reap what they sow. Watch out for more calamity from radical Islam coming against France. It is underway already this week in prophecy. All of these things, again, 
have been underreported or even ignored because of the events in Washington and to a degree in London. They ought not be. It can be a strategy of the enemy to divert people's attention from one thing he's doing by doing something else, by setting a fire or a sideshow that will get everyone's focus while he perpetrates something else. This deployment of electronic warfare apparatus of the most sophisticated kind that can now track aircraft mobility even on the tarmac in Israel, inside Israel itself, together with the deployment of the S-300 and the short-range anti-aircraft missiles around Damascus. These things have elevated the risk of another war of attrition resembling 1969 and 1970. Although the Israelis came out at, on top, nobody won. Neither Egypt nor Israel won. But it was costly for both. Yes, more costly for Egypt than for Israel, but very costly for Israel. And it aggravated and infuriated and humiliated Russia. We seem to be going back towards that kind of a scenario where history is repeating itself. But it's happening this week in prophecy. Shalom, Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper who love thee. My name is James Jacob Prash speaking to you from New York City. God bless and thank you for listening. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. We know so many of those who visit us online, Roku TV, Vimeo, and YouTube, and who read our publications are interested in the subject of prophecy and the return of Jesus. Jesus who told us to be watchful. Watch for these signs. Let that day not overtake you like a thief. And being watchful is something we ascribe tremendous importance to. Not scaremongering, not the boy who cried wolf, but a careful, rational, and above all, scriptural approach to looking at contemporary world events in light of end time prophecy, as well as studying the prophecy exegetically itself on its own merits. This year, the English Moriel Conference, not the northern one, but the main English one in the Midlands at Swanwick, England in Derbyshire, not far from Nottingham, not far from Sheffield, in the very middle of England, in the East Midlands. At Swanwick, we will have our annual conference as usual at the Hayes Christian Conference Center in Alfreton, Swanwick, near the M1, near the A38, conveniently located and easily reachable from anywhere in England or Wales or Southern Scotland. Our guest this year will be Reverend John Peters, a saved evangelical conservative true Wesleyan Methodist clergyman who has stood up within the Methodist church for the truth of God's word, for scriptural morality, and for the purposes of God for Israel and the Jews. Reverend Peters will be joining John Holler and myself. Most of you are familiar with John Haller as the American attorney, trial lawyer, who operates Prophecy Update, a very broadly viewed weekly prophecy update in the United States that is watched globally. John Haller attends a church associated with our ministry, Moriel, in Ohio, in America, but we will be delighted and blessed to welcome him and his wife, who will be joining us at Alfreton. The conference will be the 16th to the 18th of November. John Peters, John Haller, and yours truly, Jacob Prash, looking at Israel, current prophecy, and you. Israel, current prophecy, and you. That will be our theme. That's where we will be the 16th to the 18th of November. Booking details are available on the Moriel website, moriel.org. 
It's also advertised in Be Alert. However, the number you can call if you are in the UK is 07894 862 590. Speaking to Beryl or Peter Hunter, who are our conference coordinators for the UK, 07894 862 590. Actually, there are our conference coordinators for England. They will be more than happy to get you accommodation and a place in the conference. Now, we do not have a lot of places left. It is booked rather quickly, and it's booking rather quickly. But there are some places left as of today. We are not sure if we'll be able to get additional places from the Hayes Christian Conference Center or not. So I would urge you to contact us as quickly as possible if you're interested in Israel Current Prophecy in You with John Haller from the United States, John Peters, and myself. 07894-862-590, speaking to Beryl and Peter Hunter, the book of place, 16th to 18th of November, Alfreton, Swanwick, England. God bless. Hope we see you there. <laughs>